and welcome yet again to an amazing month where we're going to share very interesting stuff about business business group coaching is back this business started in 2019 on the cusp of covid right now the the entire organization has over 30 people if that is not growth you see what i meant when i told you we were bringing somebody with results to show that the reason why i need to have this is that people who follow me are mostly sinners so <laughs> So they need to hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> so he knew how to calculate cost of goods, he knew how to purchase, he knew how to price, he knew how to repair, he knew even how to collect debts. He strongly believed Jesus was a business, yes. Anyone who sets up a business to work in it, you created a job for yourself. That business will fail. When the leader sees small, yeah. The business is definitely going to stay small. small and so is everyone in it trapped in the smallness. Exactly. You who think the business people are not in kingdom business. Ooh. So welcome to Business Garage. Um, last week we had an amazing interview with uh, Professor Joao talking about business as mission and we shall be continuing that conversation this week. Uh, as we learn more and more uh, about what doing business as mission is. Uh, he helped us describe what business as mission is. And uh, if you're one of those people who has always been saying, I can only be a businessman or I can only be a full-time minister, I can't mix both. Well, he's here to help you understand how both can be done and in a way that glorifies God. And here at Worship Harvest Ministries, we have an amazing... Uh, word of the year, which is going and glorying. Eh? So I guess you get to learn more about how to go and uh, glorify God. Even you, as you glorify God, you get glorified. Yeah, yeah. So uh, don't go away. Share this link so that you can learn how going and glorying can happen for you as a business person. It's not only for uh, people who are called into full-time ministry. Uh, you can learn how to uh, blend both and be. Uh, uh, an effective uh, minister in the marketplace. Uh, besides, you're always meeting people who are not born again, so you need to be equipped for how to do that. And that's, how, that's why we are happy to have Professor Joao to continue that conversation that we started last week. So, Professor Joao, you're welcome again. It's good to be here again. So, when we're closing, you told us you have two businesses. Yeah. One is uh, an app. Right. In Brazil. Yeah. Uh, like people convene around recipes, mm -hmm. right? And it ha it has it's covering all the social, economic, environmental, uh, spiritual, and spiritual. Yeah. Less in environmental. In this case, there's not a direct environmental impact, but you know the minimum. You, you, you're trained in medicine. You're yes, a dentist, I'm right? A dentist. So remember the old Hippocratic oath, oath and the idea of do no harm. Yes, we can apply that in environmental issues as well. Right. We do things that do not harm the environment, but then other businesses actually do things in favor of stewarding creation. All right. Yeah. So the app doesn't have a direct environmental bottom line, so but we how, do no harm. So that's, how do you do the, the spiritual component in, in that business? That's a great question. So the way the, actually, so what I'm going to do is talk about how that iterated into a second app and business. Um, so I helped the first one go not well, and we learned a lot of lessons. And what happened is my associate then came up with a, a really um, groundbreaking idea. The platform is not novel, so it's based on the similar type of platform as Uber. So okay. basically you're, you're disintermediating certain service providers. So what Uber did is you disintermediated taxis. So you put here's the user and here's the driver and all I need to do in the app is connect myself with the driver, the driver. and I'll get to where I need to go. You can do that with all kinds of services. So um, this, the second app and business, we call it Anthor. Anth and we, it, that doesn't even mean anything. It's just, I won't even go into the reasons why we chose that name. It, it actually does mean something for us. It's not a real word, but it, it mm -hmm. does mean something. Um, so what Anthor does then is with a an, an Uberized business model, we're saying, so what's the, 
when you start a business, when you're an entrepreneur, you're driven by an, a desire to either innovate something that doesn't exist, and normally that's because it's going to provide something people need or it's going to solve a problem that people have. And so in this case, there was a problem, which is if you take big businesses like um, Coca-Cola, Nestle, or any other business that provides goods that need to be stocked on shelves in a pharmacy or in a, uh, a supermarket or something like that, and then you've got the pharmacies and the supermarkets, and these, these suppliers actually often will spend good money to have, Promotion. we would say, pride of place. You get the visibility. So yeah. your shelves are the ones that everybody sees. Your stock, your product, when they walk into the supermarket or the pharmacy. Yeah. So the last thing that you want is for those shelves to be empty. Now, but let's say you're, you're Coke or whatever business you are, and you have to hire a certain amount of people so that you can keep things stocked, there are only a couple of times a month where you actually have the risk of shortages. So for, forget that it's Coke, because if I say you need 100 people, you, you need way more than 100, but that's not the point. Let's use a business that needs 100 people, they employ 100 people, so it's a pretty big business, that are only concerned about making sure that their stock is always on the shelves and visible. But you only need 100 people two times a month. What's happening the rest of the month? You might need 50. So you're paying 100 people, and you really mostly only need 50. So you've got an efficiency issue here. You're actually spending money unnecessarily. And you created jobs that 50 people are like, I'm not really needed in my job. So there's a big difference between a job that creates dignity versus a job that's just a job that I, people don't care about. So they're not motivated. So, you're, so now we're solving several s problems, mm -hmm. starting with things like, we want the jobs to be dignified jobs okay. where people actually work and they produce something and they can be proud of that thing. And then from the business perspective, we don't want necessarily people paying money unnecessarily. Most of us would say, I don't care if it's Coca-Cola. Okay, yeah. you don't. But most of us are not talking about huge multinationals. Our small or medium-sized businesses, we have to find the efficiencies. And so now on the flip side of that, you've got supermarkets and pharmacies that are saying, we don't, it's not in our best interest for shelves to be empty either. And we don't have the people necessarily to do all the stocking all the time. That's why I don't know if it's the same here, but in Brazil, you'll see people doing stocking, replacing shelves, and they're not actually, typically they're from the supplier. So you'll see people, mm. they'll have a vest on and it will be whatever that large business is that they're doing, and whether it's dairy products or, you know, meat products or Coke and other junk. Sorry, yeah, now I'm recorded saying that Coke is junk. I mean, it's not healthy, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to say don't drink it because I don't want to get in trouble, but uh, maybe you should drink mm, something else. Okay, so, but you see the people replacing stock on shelves, and they're not actually from that supermarket. Mm. Well, now in Brazil, increasingly, you're going to see them wearing a vest that says Anthor, because why? The supermarket realizes, uh-oh, you know, some shelves are, are about to go empty yes. or because the, the suppliers are paying attention and they know the shelves are about to go empty. And normally it's going to be the supermarket would have had to tell, hey, you guys, I don't know if you'd realize it, but you need to send somebody over and restock. So what does Anthor do? The supermarket, drugstore, convenience store, whatever, or the supplier actually can realize the situation. They will put into the app. We need somebody at such and such a place to restock such and such a product, and we need it done within the next two hours or the next 12 hours or the next 24 hours. And so it's like somebody is calling an Uber driver. Yeah. Somebody is calling an Anthor, that's what we call them, yeah. to go do the, the yeah. restocking. Yeah. Who are the Anthors? If you think about Uber, in, with Uber, depending on where you are in the world, you either have to own or rent some sort of vehicle. Yes. Um, with Anthor... You don't even have to have a bicycle because we're talking about cities. We're talking about places that are in walking distance. So I can be an Anthor. I, can, I, don't, I can't afford a motorcycle, much less a car. I don't have a, even a bicycle. But if I'm an Anthor and I live within reach of 5, 10, 20, and depending on how much time I've got, I can walk to the place I need to go. So when we talk about social inclusion, social impact here. Yes. 
we're creating jobs for people, either, either jobs or second jobs. And I think some of you understand, in a lot of places, one job's not enough. So a second job, which can then turn into a first job, if you want it to, where I can just walk in five minutes to get to my job. I don't have to have capital investment in, in equipment like a car yeah. or even just renting it. So now, why is that a so social inclusion? Because it's creating jobs for people in, in shanty towns, favelas, or in low, their low income, um, more lower class or even towards impoverished yeah. contexts. Now, I'll give one example of why it's social inclusion. One, one of the guys who was serving as an Anthor was using a borrowed mobile phone. So he could only work if he had a phone that worked. Yeah. And unfortunately, the owner of the phone said, I need my phone back. So after several months, the owner needed the phone back. The Anthor wrote to the business. He's a humble person. Think a simple person. And he's saying, I'm sorry, I can't be an Anthor anymore because I, I no longer have a phone. Well, my associate, who was going to be in that city a week later mm. and knew that the guy had two weeks left before he had to give up his phone, took him a phone. But what he did was he went to the supermarket where the guy was working at that moment. And my, the, my colleague and one other colleague, they showed up in the supermarket. And we recorded this. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I know it sounds cynical. It's like it wasn't for marketing value. Mm. It was because we... We wanted it to be special for him, and it was so special, he was touched and said things like, nobody has ever cared for me like this before. Mm. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and that's what we get on camera. You see that. You see him emotional. You see him talking about, this now allows me to actually move out of the really horrible place that I live and take my mother with me. We're going to be able to live in a better place because I have this job as an Anthor. And, and now I really will be able to yeah. keep it because now I have my own mobile phone. Well, that's what we recorded, but off camera. Yeah. Then we share the gospel. And they have access to the gospel that they wouldn't have had before. But it started with not talking about Jesus, but living Jesus in yes. front of his eyes. Yeah. That's what caused the initial impact. And it created wow. the opportunity to share the gospel. Yeah. So, th so that's a, and that's a model that could be re reproduced in any smaller medium yeah. or large city in the world i like it uh, and you shouldn't feel bad about recording it because here in worship harvest we like to say church begins on monday and sunday yeah. is garage time yeah. so we are encouraged to go and be church to people from monday to yeah. saturday then sunday yeah. come and be equipped to go back and do it so yeah i mean we we have to tell others about it so that they can learn from us mm -hmm. how to go and be church so you were yeah. church to the antho who you because you attached to him, now you gave him a chance to be born yeah. again. Yeah. And you, maybe he has also got other people born again, right? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, so in, in our case, it did have to do with privacy issues and certain security issues that, you know, we wanted to respect him. But you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. we, we don't have shame in, in, in presenting the gospel at all. That, that wasn't the issue. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, briefly, tell us about your second business. Then we can talk about how you've applied BAM globally. Okay. First tell us about that global business. And you might, yeah, that one is not brief, but because the story is so amazing, so just help me speed up if I need to. Okay. All right. So the, f the first iteration, and this is, the story teaches the lesson, so that's why I want to help you guys uh, hear and understand mm. how God works. So in the 2000s, early 2000s, when I'm trying to learn about business's mission, and I was on that traditional ministry model, so I had a group of people friends and supporters who actually gave money every month for me to be able to do ministry. It's a traditional missionary model. And one of them is a very successful lawyer in Texas, really smart guy. And so I'm trying to learn how to do business. He actually is a lawyer. He's a business lawyer. So he's the guy that you go to when you're talking about valuations of businesses yeah. um, and you need not, not the accounting side, but the legal side. When, when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, things like that. So he's real smart. And I would call him up about once every six months and I would say, Michael, can you please explain something to me? So it was like I didn't have a synapse to go to. I didn't, I mean, I did like some MBA studies, but sometimes that's not real practical. And so 
I'd call Michael and I'd say, teach me something, because you know it in real life how to do it. So it was a mini MBA lesson. Every time I called him, it was about once every six months. And this went on for several years. And then at one point he said, if this was to the, kind of the end of 2007, and he goes, okay, wait a minute. You, I thought you were asking questions so that you could lead a, an organization better, a mission organization, but you actually are asking business and finance questions so clearly it's not for the ministry, like for the ministry organization. But you've been saying this thing called BAM, and I guess I wasn't paying attention. What is, tell me again, why are you asking all these questions? What is BAM? So I explained it to him, and about six months later, he called me up. And he said, hey, just wanted to let you know, I'm giving up my law practice. I've convinced a senior executive at Texas Instruments, which is a large multinational. Yeah. And back in the day, they're the ones that produced the scientific calculators and uh, before fantastic. you could do it all on your mobile phone. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, he had multiple MBAs and master's degrees in finance. And just so, wow, you know, these two guys are amazing. Um, and then he goes, so just wanted to let you know, we're going to start a BAM business. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. What are you going to do? He said, we have no idea. <laughs> we just know that God wants us to do this. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Like, maybe it would have been a good idea to actually have a thing, like a product or a service or something before. And they go, no, it's a journey of faith. Well, that's one of the first lessons I discovered. Entrepreneurship for Christ and business's mission for Christ is as much of a journey of faith as any support-raising missionary ever goes on. Because ultimately, you're both trusting the same loving Heavenly Father to take care of you and to mm. give you insights in how to do what you're, what you're called to do. Yeah. So then Michael says, and you're coming with us. Like, yeah, yeah there are two of us. There are going to be three of us. And I'm, I'm like, I said, but I don't know anything about business. He didn't call me an idiot because he was being respectful, but he basically could have. He goes, yes, but that's the point. You don't understand business, but you understand mission. We don't understand the mission part, but we understand the, bis the, the business part. It's business as mission, right? We got to have B and M. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I've been saying for years. That makes sense. It's like, oh, yeah, now, oh, no, wait a minute. Now he's ask they're actually asking me to be involved in a business. Well, that's what I was asking God. I want to be involved. They gave me this golden opportunity, and then we ended up having a fourth person from England uh, join us as an associate, as a as a partner and an associate. So we started to produce what the World Health Organization I, I, we didn't produce. We had technology that the World Health Organization said was disruptive technology for diagnosing tuberculosis. Okay, okay what are we looking at? We want to save a million lives a year of yeah. people who don't have to die of tuberculosis. Nobody has to die of tuberculosis, it can be treated. The problem is when it takes too long to diagnose it, it's too late. Mm. And so, well, but wait a minute. So, the, like, aren't there ways to diagnose tuberculosis? Yes, yes. That, like 150 years old. Mm. It's, it's a Petri dish. You get a saliva sample, okay. and you have a, a, a culture, you let it grow, and then you can decide, you can confirm. Yeah, but it's is it tuberculosis or not? Yes. That takes four to eight weeks, basically. That time span could be the difference between life and death mm. for people. And so, so it can't just be cheap. That's cheap. It has to be fast. Okay, but there are fast technologies. Yes, there are, and they're very expensive, and you have to go to a hospital. So, so what is disruptive in our case? It has to be cheap. It has to be fast. fast. You ought to be able to administer it Anywhere. It's called point of contact. Like in the jungle, in the desert. You don't, you don't want people to have to go to a hospital. And ideally, it would be administered by a non-technical specialist. It could be administered by anybody. Yes. By the actual person who potentially has tuberculosis. So we had, theoretically, all of that. Cheap, fast, non-hospital based, point of contact, and, and done by a non-technician. We had some technologies that we developed. We had some technologies that others developed. When we put all of those together, so you knock down all of the technology dominoes, you get your final solution to the problem. In our, in our case, the way to diagnose tuberculosis. Well, in the journey, we had 
I mean, this is public knowledge, I mean, so I can say this. We had millions of dollars invested from places like the Gates Foundation when it wasn't kind of like a sin to talk about <laughs> Bill Gates, you know, it's like, um, <laughs> and money coming from, our research was being done at, at Stanford University, one of the best in the world, and Texas A&M University, which is actually an amazing research university. Um, th there were things happening all along the way where everybody's saying this is amazing and this is disruptive and, you know, you're going to change the world and you're going to save lives and we believed it and we were in it for six years going after this final um, product but we could not make it work so we made it work point of contact among cows and it's like there's money there but there's no other the other impact is not there we we don't want cows Just to not humans, die i mean we, yeah. we don't want cows to die of tuberculosis yeah. but we really want people not to die of tuberculosis we could make it work on people, but it, only in a hospital. So you see, we were getting some of the disruptive components, but not all of them. And to be truly disruptive, it had to be all of them. So in 2016, we started, we, had, we always prayed for the business. We always prayed together. We, mm. It was a BAM business. But we started specifically to pray and say, God, you are the scientist who understands the formula and can make it work. We need that information. So if we don't have, if you don't give us that, then we are going to understand that you're asking us to stop our research and maybe shut down the business. This is the hardest moment in the life of an entrepreneur when you start to realize there's a real chance that maybe it's not going to work. Because normally month after month, especially early on, I mean, you're full of passion and enthusiasm and excitement and you still have something left to sell when you don't have money for the business. By the way, here's a funny, kind of a joke. What's the difference between an entrepreneur and a functionary, an employee? Tell us. <laughs> the employee steals things from work and takes them home. The entrepreneur steals things from home and takes them and to work. work. <laughs> That's, oh, that, wow. that is a real entrepreneur. What do I have left to sell so I can make the business stay alive? Yes. Well, we were... My friends, my associates, even more than me, I mean, they were mm. selling everything they had, and we were still going after new investors, and, and there was promise, but in 2016, we started to think, maybe this is not going to work. Mm. And so, all the way up until October, we sensed, mm, maybe God is asking us to shut things down, to the point at which my, the, my associate, who was the CEO of the business, had to fly from the United States to England for a, a basically a half hour. It ended up being several hours, but meeting with one of our major investors to say, we are sorry, it's not going to work, and we actually are going to have to shut down the business. So he, now I'm going to get back to that because yeah. the good news is, and, and then I'll go back and look at some of the lessons. The good news is we actually went, ended up going through an organic merger with a different business. Remember I always say it's the second one that goes really, yes. and it's going really well. I, I want to get to that in a minute. But when we felt like, well, this maybe is a failure, when you think it's a failure, you've got to ask, is it a failure? If it's a failure, it's because I blew it somehow. Because we did things wrong. Maybe we knew we were doing things wrong. Maybe we were, we were unethical. Maybe we were driven just be, by the money and not by the kingdom impact. Wrong priorities. And so... That made us make bad decisions. I mean, you've got to evaluate that. And sometimes we are responsible directly for the demise of the business. But if you're walking in faith, if you're saying God day after day, month after month, year after year, we exist for your glory. I, I love, by the way, I love that going in glory. Yes. The going is, it's a great commission. God tells us to go. The glorying is we do it for his glory the business for his glory, and, and then, forgive me, I do have some theological dimensions, and there's a theological component here. When you talked about praying and receiving Christ, and there is salvation in that. We're born again. That's biblical language. You can check it out in John chapter 3. Okay, we're born again. That's the beginning of a process, which... So the salvation process has three components. There is the justification moment in time where you're standing before the judge becomes one of not you are guilty and you mm. go to hell. It's you are now declared innocent by the blood of Christ and you are going to spend eternity with me. That, that's a moment in time when you recognize Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Yes. 
That's called justification. But the, the experience goes on for the rest of your life, which we call the sanctification process, where God transforms you into the image of Christ for his glory. So is it possible? Wait a minute. How could I have done anything wrong? Because I'm already saved. Yes. You do things wrong because you're still sinful as a human, but less and less and less because God does that process of sanctification. Yes. There's a discipleship component here where oh, you, yes. you study Scripture together and you're praying together and you're being mentored and discipled and you're serving God through your local church. You're serving God by way of your business you can be discipled by way of your business. You can disciple others by way of your business context. And then you said glorying. That's what made me yes. think of all this. The third component, I'm justified. That's a moment in time. My standing before my Savior, my God is now made right. My sins are paid for, and I belong to the one true God. He's my heavenly Father. Justification. Yes. And then you go through this Sanctified. sanctification process. And then it ends with, glorification we step into eternity with god and we get our new glorified selves where there's no sin anymore we're not even capable of sinning anymore and we benefit from our position as of worshipers of god and for all eternity we're in his presence worshiping yeah. the lamb of god it's the vision of revelation 5 um, revelation 7 where all tribes tongues nations languages are gathered before god worshiping the lamb yeah. so going because we want the Lamb, we want Jesus to be known among all spheres of society, all, spheres, yeah. all peoples of the world. And then the glorying, we're giving him glory, and then we get the glory. We get to be glorified. Man, I love that. If you understand that whole salvation process, justification, sanctification, uh, glorification. glorification, actually doing business or any other prof profession, career, job for God's glory starts to make a whole lot more sense. Mm. Because you're giving God glory here and now as you're preparing to fulfill your role as yeah. an eternal worshiper of God. All right. So we're looking back at six years and we're going, God, why? Why didn't it work? And he said, well, wait a minute. Don't consider it a failure just yet. Mm. Was there fruit along the way? And we started to identify examples. Yes. We did clinical testing in Vietnam. We did it in three countries. Vietnam was one. Vietnam is primarily Buddhist. And we know of at least one nurse that was involved in the process who came to Christ as a result of the fact that our business was doing business there. We were doing clinical tests there, and we were clear in our faith as Christians. And yes, we know one person. I'm, I'm glad that people clap. That's really exciting when people come to Christ. So this Buddhist realized that that fat guy named Buddha, who was a real human being who died and he's still in his grave, was not the Savior, and Jesus is. So then we started looking around in other places, and we realized there were other people in other countries that had come to Christ. That was part of our goal. Yes. Well, that means, oh, it wasn't a failure because people were encountering Christ. Then we looked at, we had billionaire Gulf State sheikhs mm. who controlled investment funds, who were interested in our technology, interested in our business, and who we had contact with repeatedly, who actually ended up Hearing the gospel, I don't know if any of them actually came to Christ, but they understood what it means to be a real Christian, and they had not understood that before. Yeah. So, and then we're like, okay, so people from different religions, different societal, you know, socioeconomic levels were hearing the gospel. One of my partners gave a lecture at Cambridge University. Well, he's there as a Christian, and people know he's a Christian, and he's coming back, and he's going, I'm just a lawyer from Texas. How did I get a chance to lecture at one of the best universities in the world? Oh, wow. And then Chris, the engineer, co-authors an article in one of the, the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. Mm. And he's saying, I'm just an engineer from Texas. How did I get to be published in such a prestige? Well, God's doing all of these things all along the way. Final story on that. Mm. When Michael flew back to England to tell some of the investors, we're sorry we lost your yeah, money, yeah. they said, well, we knew, we saw that that was going to happen. Because they have technicians, they have technical people, they have scientists, they want to protect their investments. And they realized there was one piece of technology nobody was going to be able to figure out. And we didn't see it coming, but it was real. And so when Michael basically says, we're going to have to shut things down, they said, you know what? We actually understand and by the way, whatever your next technology is or whatever your next business is, come back and ask us for more money. 
because they liked us. They wow. saw our eth that we did things ethically. They yeah. saw that we did things with excellence. They th saw that we were professionals, and they wanted to still do business with us. That is a gospel impact because it's clear, and they know this, that w what was driving us was Christ in us, yes. not money or not some do-gooder idea of maybe only saving lives. It was all for a higher purpose. So I'll stop and pause, and you decide if you want to hear the rest of the story, but the new business that we ended up merging into only could have happened because we saw that we were in the process of shutting one thing down, which freed us then to go join forces with another business, which now is, it produces the world's best insect repellent, which is all nature-based, and you won't believe me, and normally I'd have to say, please don't say this anywhere in public, and I wouldn't say it on a recording, but you won't believe me anyway, so I'm just going to say it. We have a cure for certain types of cancer, and this is a kingdom, it's, a, it's business's mission, it's what we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. one of the best businesses I know that brings the spiritual bottom line, the social bottom line, the economic bottom line, and the environmental bottom line. So... Um, without going into details, although I love to. And, and Juliet has heard me go into details on all of this too, and I talk yes. a lot, so I'm not going to do it unless you ask. The fact is that when we who are created in God's image and we have the mind of Christ and we have the Holy Spirit in us, mm. we kind of like to say we have an unfair competitive advantage. Like oh, yes. our, our non-Christian competitors, mm. sh they don't have anything over us. We are children of God. And so we ought to be coming up with these creative solutions to yes. save lives and lead people to Christ. So, well, you get to tell us that story off camera because we're in the yeah. room. You'll I, be I telling know. Us that I'm story. sorry. Yeah, but I, we are in the closing round and we have quite uh, some questions and we are going to have quick answers to them. So we have a member of the audience. I heard what he said. He said quick answers. Okay, <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. Um, so... The members of the audience are going to ask questions. I might also get, uh, if time allows, a couple of questions for you. Uh, let's go to our first uh, member of the audience who has a question. Tell us your name, your business, and then delve into your question. Yes, the number is one. Yes. My name is um, Tasa Patrick, and I am into insurance. I, I, am a, I am a broker, I'm an agent of insurance. There's always uh, that uh, uh, scripture that many people quote. They say you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. And uh, I don't know whether some people quote it out of, uh, out of context. So my question is, how do you apply that scripture in this context of uh, business with a mission? Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that's actually an incredible, it's, it's a profound question because there are too many Christians who don't understand that relationship. So I'll start off with the quick answer in case I don't have time to say more. Um, you, you cannot serve God and mammon, money, but you can make money serve God. And when you do business God's way, you are saying that money is not the goal, money is the means by which we achieve the goal. The goal is God's glory in all areas of your lives and in all spheres of Ugandan society and among all peoples of the world. And in order for that to really happen, there has to be all kinds of transformation. The transformations are driven economically. To do the things you need to do, you've got to have the resources. So you're not going after the resources as the goal, you're going after the resources so you can achieve the goal. So it's an issue of priority. Who serves what? The money serves God and not vice versa. And the children of God don't exist in order to make the money. We exist in order to serve God. And then to do that, we make the money. So think of it like this. Money, the, the other passage that people really get wrong, it, when Timothy, Timothy says, or when Paul says to Timothy, he doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. He says that the, the love of money, money is the root of all evil. So if you love money, it means money is your idol. If you love mammon, it means mammon is your idol and not God. And God's saying, you know, I'm not going to put up with that for too long. Yeah. So, so either you're going to live a miserable life, even though you might be wealthy, but you're going to be miserable because you're not walking in fellowship with me the, the way that I want. The money and the profit are the, 
or the blood in the veins of the business to make the thing alive, to mm -hmm. make the thing do what it's supposed to do. Okay. And what it's supposed to do is bring about these fourfold transformations. Wonderful. Um, let's have a second question. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Martin Mwezi. I'm a financial consultant. Um, in uh, our community, we have something that we call FMF, which is Feed My Family. And you have rightly taught us that we need to change that FMF from Feed My Family to Feed My Flock. So the question <laughs> is, how do we change our mindset as uh, Christian businesses from the Feed My Family to Feed My Flock that I believe will ultimately lead to the glorification of God in our businesses. Because you talked about the top line mm. not being income, but now being doxa. Yeah. What does that look like? Thank you. Oh, my goodness. You guys, <laughs> these questions are phenomenal. And, and actually, I'm really glad you're asking these types of questions and not... Like, how do I, you know, what, what policies should I have for setting pricing and things like that? Um, and if you do have questions like that, you can talk to Juliet because she runs a whole program that's going to help you figure out the answers yes. to those kind of uh, business things. This question that you just asked is that's where, you know, the expression we say where the rubber hits the road. That's where things become real. It, and we'll call it faith integration. How do you integrate faith into your business? Mm -hmm. Because it's different. You being a Christian, but having doing business as usual, like I think we talked about earlier, that's not business's mission. If you're a Christian and if God owns the business and you're the steward and he's saying integrate faith into and through this business, how do you do that? And so I think there are th probably three ways that we could describe it. Um, but the first thing is it has to be intentional. That's not a way. That's, an, that's a mindset. You've got to deliberately say, I know that I exist for the praise of God's glory. I know that he's asked me to steward a business. Therefore, I need to be intentional about his glory, starting with the message of salvation, being very clear through my business. The three ways that you do that, I think, the three ways that you integrate faith are intrinsic, internal, and external. And I'll explain that quickly. Intrinsic yes. and internal are not the same thing. So intrinsic, it's not what you look like it's the dna inside of you that determines what you look like so it's not what the business looks like it's what drives the business internally so everything about the the kind of the way you do business intrinsically should be driven by your christian values by a biblical worldview and so if you are saying well what is my attitude towards hiring and firing people You've got to be driven not by how the world says you do that, which is all about efficiency. You're not doing your job. You're fired. Well, intrinsically, you're saying, yeah, but that's not how God says to treat people. So maybe before I immediately fire someone, okay, I know it sounds so cliche, but what would Jesus do? How does Jesus treat a person in that situation? So now the intrinsic value that determines what you do, now we're talking about internal faith integration. So... I'm driven by a value to treat people with dignity. So how do I do that? Well, maybe before firing them, I'm going to make sure I have it, that my business is functioning in a professional and ethical way, which says I need to deal with this person with dignity and respect. So have my policies, has this business been set up in a way that that person actually knows what they're supposed to be doing? Basic question. Have we equipped that person to be able to do what they're supposed to be doing? So maybe it's not that person's fault at all that they're not producing. Maybe I blew it because my policy is not appropriate or my training is not appropriate. So internally, now I'm looking for ways to actively let the gospel be the gospel. So it could look like, I'm, I'm really talking about internally with the way you do things with employees, with the way you decide what products and services you're going to produce, with the excellence by which you produce them. So internally, we've got a dynamic going on, but it's all about the people in particular. So how is faith internally being manifest? And it could be the way that you could do something obvious like, hey, we have a volunteer yeah. Bible study on a certain day, or we have prayer meetings. You can come if you want. We're not forcing you to, but if you mm -hmm. want to come, it could be as obvious as that, yeah. or it could be more subtle in the way you treat people. That's internal. External is, I've got clients, I've got suppliers, 
I've got customers, I'm inserted in a, maybe a physical community, or I'm inserted in a virtual community, or my business is inserted in an industry. So how are we looking outwardly, externally, and saying, yes, we can manifest our faith creatively in certain ways so that our suppliers and our customers and clients and everybody knows that Jesus is Lord. Now, yes. it might not be that you can verbally say that all the time. But it might be something similar. One of my good friends in Brazil has a large business that is a logistics and transport business. All of his trucks, they're all red. And on the side, they all say, we trust in God. It's like Uganda. You can say that in public. Yeah. And so he does because you can. But then you better make sure that the things that you're doing and the way that you're doing them mean that everybody knows you're trusting in God and they don't look at you and go, oh, that's a Christian. I don't think I want to be a Christian. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, our third and final question. Please go ahead and ask. Thank you. My name is CD. I work with a company called Antfit that builds uh, winning teams using the power of play. Uh, my question is um, in related to, you've talked about BAM and the four results from a BAM business. My question is the habits. You've hinted on some of the habits that can lead to those results. If you could spotlight on the keystone habits that could help us get the BAM results. What would those keystone habits be? I love it. Thank you for asking that question. So I will talk about a habit, um, and it's not probably what you're expecting. It may not even be what you're hoping for. Um, but everything else flows from this one habit. And so remember I said I met the Lord when I was 16. I'm now 57. Yes. I've been walking with the Lord for 41 years, and I never looked back. So when I – and that's – thank you for him, right? You're clapping for God because – it's not because of me. I, I can't get myself saved. I can't keep myself saved. But God can do that. Yeah. And that's that sanctification process that we go through. By the way, some people might say it like this. It's easy to become a Christian. It's hard to be a Christian. You know what I mean? It's hard to be dis a disciple. It's hard to do the things that give God glory because sometimes they're just easier ways to do it, including and maybe especially in business where, where we are tempted to let our habits be habits of convenience mm. or comfort or expedience. Ah, it's easier if we do things that way. We'll get it done faster. Yeah, but that's kind of um, not looking so ethical. So really, yeah, but we'll, get, we'll produce more. It'll be faster. Mm, yeah, really? That, so, but I want to back up, and I want to say that the number one habit, which unfortunately I did not learn until much more recently in life, even though I was walking with the Lord, mm. I went through a process of burnout, I, I burned out badly because I am very driven, and my drive is such a holy drive, if I can say it like that, right? I mean, I started a ch global church planting organization. I love church planting. We, we've gone to, planted 4,000 churches among people that have never had access to the gospel. And so it's easy to go, yeah, so therefore, don't sleep very much because got to save the world, or don't rest on Sunday or on Saturday or at least one day a week, the, the Sabbath principle. Or uh, vacation, you don't need a vacation because people are dying and going to hell. you got to save the world. You might even think that through your business. And I hope you do, in a sense, think my business is, is as important as any quote-unquote ministry. But if you think, therefore, never stop, that's a problem. And my problem wasn't that I worked too much. It's that I rested too little because I thought I was invincible. I thought I could do everything. And was I asking God? Oh, yeah. And was I having my quiet time? Was I in church? Was I serving in my church? Yeah, I'm a pastor. I actually do pastoral stuff as well. And yeah. so I'm doing all the right things. But the one discipline, if you can call it that, that I really, the, the one habit that I really was not doing was genuine daily communion with God in the sense of, huh, random moments throughout the day just stopping and saying, hey, dad, or if you're in business and you're like, hey, boss, is there anything you want to tell me right now? Is there anything I need to know? Because I don't want to miss out. Mm. And it's not like, well, I read my Bible today. There might have been something I needed to know. That's great. And please do that. It's the word of God. But you, you got to have constant communion with your heavenly father who's also the owner of the business. And it can be random. I randomly now just stop. It, it's a habit that, that Christians had a thousand years ago that, that monks and others had, which is st stop. Because we live in, in 
a world and in every day where we go from one transition to another, we don't even stop one thing before we're already doing another thing. And there's this habit of stopping for a minute. Mm. Just stop for a minute and just relax for a minute. Just breathe. I, I'm serious. It's like I realized, wow, I don't even breathe right. I'm always in such a hurry. So stop and breathe, inhale, and just say, hey, Dad, do you want to say anything? And, and honestly, 95% of the time, he's, he's probably not going to say anything, but at least you relaxed for a minute. But when he does, oh, my goodness, he's going to say something. You're going to go, wow, and then you know what to do or you know who to talk to or you know. So have that habit of communicating with God, your loving Heavenly Father, who owns the business, and he's got things. He doesn't want you to do all the talking. Yeah. When you pray and ask God for stuff all the time, he's like, if you would just calm down for a minute, I would actually like to answer that, but you need yes. to stop and listen. So be in the habit. Many, so Sabbath principle, then I'm done. Mm. The Sabbath principle on a micro level, stop during the day for a minute, multiple times, just stop. Rest. Ask him if he wants to talk to you. I call that micro Sabbath just because it's easy to remember. Yes. Sabbath principle, 24 hours a week. It doesn't have to be necessarily on Sunday or the literal Saturday Sabbath. I mean, I can't rest on Sunday, and most of us can't rest on Sunday because we're serving in our churches on Sunday. Yeah. So it, then maybe it needs to be Saturday. You figure it out, but turn off. This is what I never did. Turn off. Turn your phone off. Or give it to your spouse or somebody and say, do not let me go anywhere near this thing. Well, I might be expecting something urgent. Ask your spouse, hold on to this, because if something urgent does come in, you tell me if it's urgent. Don't let me decide, because it's always yeah. urgent. If I decide, the spouse decides. Yeah. Turn off. Spend time with God. Spend time with your family. Spend time with your friends. Spend time out in a park, in nature. Commun it's literal 24-hour period turned off. And take vacations, like real vacations. I call that macro Sabbath. I, don't yes. ha I didn't have to invent these terms, but I did because it makes it easier to remember. <laughs> I never would take serious vacations. My family suffered because of that. Like, mm. I never turned off. They never got to rest more than a few days at a time. And at some point, I was like, wait, that's stupid. Because I don't even start to unwind until about three or four days. You cannot actually genuinely experience rest. Yes. And, re and physical, emotional, mental recovery until you turn off. And normally, those of us that enjoy what we do or are driven, entrepreneurs are like this. Pastors and missionaries are like this. Business leaders are like this. It takes three or four days for you actually to start to be able to then enjoy the rest. So you got to take a week at least of vacation. So my number one bottom line relates to direct communion with God, and you do that by honoring the Sabbath principle on a micro level, on a macro level, and on the true level of 24 hours a week turning off. Thank you so much, Professor Joao. My pleasure. A big round of applause for him. Thank you for adding value to us today. Amen. Uh, I mean, we wish we had all the time, but we've run out of time. Uh, Fortunately, for those in the studio, you can get to interact with him a little more after, but we have to close. Uh, thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, you're watching and you say, I want to know God like Professor Joao knows God. It's simple. You say a prayer and you get to have access to the Father who gives you all uh, answers to those questions you have. So it's a simple prayer. You say, dear Lord, you repeat after me, dear Lord. Thank you, for loving me, thank you for loving me, and thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and make my life uh, significant. Make my life significant. Amen. Amen. If you've said that prayer, you're born again. You have access to the Father. Uh, you have access to Jesus. And you can learn more how to walk with him. Uh, call the number that will be running on the screen. It is plus 256-775-642449. Uh, there's a pastor at the end of the line who will help you uh, understand the decision, the decision you've made and the next steps to take. Uh, from us at Business Garage, we'd like to thank you once again for tuning in. Uh, make sure you tune in the next time. We always have something to help you grow in your uh, relationship with God and also in how to do business the kingdom way. Enjoy your week.
बिजनेस कराज